Oh jeez. One sec. Oh. All right, you couldn't get it to cut off the top of the screen. Biogeography. Basically, the geography of plants and animals, right, in a nutshell. Um, when uh, I was a grad student at the University of Minnesota, we actually had a class that was just biogeography. It was huge. Uh, people really, really found it of interest. Uh, thousand students. It's one of those big auditorium classes. Well, anyway, um, Chapter starts out with some pretty unique trees, uh, but it's uh, not necessarily a unique mechanism to try to conserve water uh, to grow in a way that you're kind of shading your own roots and giving your, yourself a lot of shade in a very sunny climate. We'll see lots of plants that do similar things. <clears throat> All right, well, lots of stuff to cover in this chapter. Um, like I said, usually this topic in this chapter is pretty popular with people. The only downside actually with this text, uh, our textbook is that it does lots of lists. So as I go through here, I'll encounter big lists and I'll go past it because I'm not, not going to just read a whole bunch of lists of things. Uh, I'll talk more big picture and broader categories of things, right? Um, so some terms to start us off with, uh, species, right, group of individuals that naturally interact and can breed and produce fertile offspring. Uh, Non-native, otherwise known as invasive species often, uh, well it depends on the species specifically. Uh, there's lots of non-native uh, species that don't necessarily do bad things to the ecosystem that they are introduced to. And then there's, well, there's plenty of species that we have introduced to places for our own purposes. Uh, and we basically just don't consider them invasive because uh, they are where we, we already want them to be as humans. <clears throat> um, but examples where this can go wrong. Uh, the Nile perch. Uh, there's been actually a ton written about the Nile perch. Um, in a nutshell, well, and this is actually a small one. They grow to be really huge, like they carry them in uh, whirl barrels and stuff. Uh, and that's part of the reason why they introduced them to Lake Victoria, uh, is because, well, there's a lot of fishing going on in the lake already, and they were, they kind of were like, well, what about these giant fish that are just down in the river by us? What if we introduce them? And sure enough, at first, they bred like crazy and it was huge amounts and great big fish harvests. Uh, but through time, because there were no natural predators in this lake, uh, eventually through time, there wasn't any other fishes besides this fish, uh, to the point where it started to, uh, the only other fish it could eat would be younger versions of itself. Uh, which, as you can imagine, was not super sustainable kind of destroy that ecosystem. Uh, elements of the ecosystem still exist, uh, but that's the thing that kind of invasive species can do. <clears throat> As I said, biogeography, um, geography of plants and animals. So I like to think of it. Uh, biodiversity, all these terms you've probably heard before, a number of living species in a specified region. Um, <coughs> In general, places that have more plants and animals are more biodiverse, right? Kind of simple. Uh, ecology, study of interactions between organisms and their environment, ecosystem, both living organisms within the community and non-living environment in which the organisms live. Um, we all basically know about the nutrient cycle. Uh, there's living parts of it. There's, of course, not living parts of it. Um, but it's all kind of mutually sustaining. Like I said, this structure has a lot of lists. Uh, I'm not going to go through every single list. Uh, you can look that up when you take your quiz. Oh, another list. All right. Uh, no, I'm not going to go through these lists. Big picture. Uh, well, when it comes to Earth's biodiversity, it might involve more insects than you had. Uh, predicted if you had thought it ahead, um, just because we don't experience that aspect of uh, Earth's bi biodiversity that much. 
uh, other organisms do a lot. Extinction, uh, another term that people probably know, um, extinctions can happen large scale or small scale. Uh, there have been a number of mass extinction events. Uh, actually, there was a news article saying that people know of the, the dodo bird that has went extinct. Well, went extinct. Humans hunted it until it was no more, uh, as, as we like to do. Um, well, there's a company that wants to bring them back because we have their genetics because they died out relatively recently. Uh, maybe it's a, a similar experiment to like uh, Jurassic Park and the dinosaurs. Maybe we'll have dodo birds <coughs> encircling the globe. <clears throat> Patterns of biodiversity. Well, in a nutshell, um, as I said, uh, places that have more biodiversity, if they tend to have uh, larger amounts of land, and we, when these talk about biogeographic islands, you can picture actual islands, because that is somewhat of what they're talking about, but it's a bit more metaphorical, because you'll have uh, zones of tolerance for different species where they, they can't survive outside of their little zone of tolerance. Uh, I think one of the first days I might have shown something about, well, ants, right? Expanding fire ants, expanding their zones of tolerance, but there's certain hard limits. Uh, fire ants, although they, they come from warmer climates, they have spread up to North America, but they can't, uh, they can't survive still any place that has a freeze. So there is a, a zone of tolerance, as we say. <clears throat> Biodiversity maps, this is probably similar to what you would expect. Amphibian, mammal, bird, basically similarly, places that have plenty of sun and plenty of moisture are able to usually have more biodiversity. Uh, similar, similar trends. Um, also, in general, we're talking about land masses and biodiversity. There's a pretty set uh, level at which the size of the island increases the ability of that space to have more diversity, the larger it is. Probably will make sense to you if you picture a tiny small island versus a great big island. Uh, what kind of plants and animals would be able to survive in each? Migration. Another term we know a lot, just because we live in an area that has lots of migratory birds. Um, this is a way to, if an animal isn't in its zone of tolerance uh, for the full year, well, if it moves itself out of uh, the unpleasant weather changes, all right, they could keep surviving. Uh, so interesting things about how animals migrate. Um, in general, they could, they could uh, travel in a way somewhere that we can. We can both see the sun rise and fall and kind of guesstimate what direction we're going based on the time of day and the angle of the sun. Uh, something that they have that I, I don't think that we do, um, actual magnetic parts of their brain that can sense, uh, well, sense where the magnetic north itself poles are. Um, this Actually, this is becoming a bit controversial these days because, well, we'll cover it more when we uh, talk about the Earth's core, uh, but the Earth's core appears to be it slows down and then reverses, uh, like every 70 years or so. And we seem to be in one of those periods of time where the Earth core seemed to have stopped and or reversed at this juncture. Hopefully there'll be more data before we actually reach that chapter in a month or so. Um, so how do we track uh, animals to see their migrations? Well, as you can see, the, they have little tags on them, right? Don't need to go over every single type of tag that we put on animals and plants, uh, but we, we monitor them with computers and satellites. Uh, not difficult to, to picture. Um, so origins of biodiversity, right? Evolution being one of the drivers uh, because species will differentiate and if they differentiate enough, uh, they become subspecies, they become actual different species. Uh, we use the term population talking about a group of organisms that interact and interbreed in the same geographic area. Um, so for example, when you go to like Yellowstone or something, they'll talk about the park's population of this and that, right? Um, 
Let's see. Speciation. Well, I thought we got a picture somewhere. No? All right, I guess I'll just read it then. Um, well, th this is the process of evolution. And, and when animals branch off into new animals. Um, convergent evolution. Uh, well, this happens when you have a similar environment that are in different areas of the world and completely different species of animals. Sometimes similar species, if they're in the same environment, they will adapt in the same way, right? Um, so for example, hopping animals, hopping animals, which may not seem like the most productive way to move across the Earth's surface, uh, but it is uh, in environments that have lots of sand. Uh, I don't know if you've tried walking on a sandy day, especially if there's something is at an incline or something, uh, and it's just kind of tough to, to get through. Well, if you were hopping, you'd get through it faster. Uh, plants also will adopt very similar mechanisms. Uh, that's why you see, well, things that are cactuses that's around the world aren't actually related to each other, uh, but they develop similar strategies to conserve their water budgets. Uh, let's see. Oh, so I mentioned hopping, uh, tough tails. Also, nocturnal activity makes a lot of sense in deserts. Uh, just don't go out when it's sunny, right? Uh, a couple different things. Divergent evolution. Uh, well, that is that's what it sounds like. Uh, dispersal. That's organisms <coughs> going out around off around the planet, any place that they can reach. Oh, this is the example I was looking for earlier. Um, and I thought our video did a good job of showing this, how you could start off with one specific type of species, um, but then it differentiates in these examples based on what specifically type of food it was going for. I would say usually the long-billed ones are ones that go after flowers. Uh, the ones with a kind of a harder beak tend to go after insects, for example. Uh, and this is how they're able to be successful uh, you could have you could have an area where both of those varieties well they don't compete with each other right if one is eating bugs and one is going after flowers then they all both have their niche as we call it a niche that I just used the living and non-living resources and environmental conditions that a species requires the book says to think about it like the animal's job um, well, I guess that's just capitalism putting itself in all college textbooks in some way or other, I suppose. Uh, habitat, physical environment in which an organism lives. Uh, it's just thinking of it as its address. Uh, so when we're looking at uh, these different uh, animals, um, well, how do, I, how do I put all this in a, in a big picture? I got a picture somewhere that I can put in a big picture? Not really. Um, well, species are either general, generalists or specialists, right? Generalists tend to do better when they uh, move into different zones. They could consume a larger range of things and they can kind of be sturdy to a larger range of environments. A specialist, um, and the more of a specialist something is, the more it's vulnerable to kind of a small area, small species. And so, for example, well, if you have the example of the birds where some are eating bugs um, and some are eating the nectar from flowers, uh, you know, if it's just maybe just one bug, it's become a real big specialist. And then something happens to that bug, uh, that's detrimental for that species. In um, Environments that have long-term sustainability and haven't had a lot of changes, a species can live like that for a super long time, but it's vulnerable, right? It's vulnerable if it has that small of a niche. <clears throat> yeah. Limiting factors, right? What's, what stops plants and animals from being able to go into different places? Very often it's just the physical, the weather or climate at a place. Uh, but very often it could be predators, it could be competition. Um, 
animals can do things to, to protect themselves if, well, if the weather of a place uh, doesn't actually suit them. Uh, and this is a, a lot of things, of course, in Minnesota here, we know that plenty of plants just kind of go dormant. Uh, some number of animals also are able to do that um, if they can't migrate, right? They adopt other, other mechanisms to compensate. Um, so through time, right, looking at the way ecosystems work, uh, geographers often will study places that have been kind of wiped clean from the map, right? So you could have something like a volcanic eruption. Geographers really like to study that because they want to see what plants and animals come in first, right? What are the pioneer plants and animals? Uh, and then you examine that community as you have a succession as, as, as it becomes as biodiverse as it kind of possibly can through time. Uh, that's when we're talking about a, a climax community that is uh, basically an ecosystem that has kind of left to be. Uh, and as I said, there's a, there's a whole process that happens. Um, actually, these days, a lot of geographers are specifically looking at not new volcanic islands, but there's a number of islands that have been ice capped for long periods of time that are being exposed as the ice cap recedes in lots of different areas. Uh, these tend to be pretty far north, as you can imagine, but these are also places where people are studying because, again, it starts out as kind of a clean slate, and then you you look at the succession and what plant communities come in first and what you know birds and animals come in first. Uh, couple different adaptive mechanisms discussed here. Plants that, for example, well, if you're in a warmer climate, your leaves might be pointed in a way that uh, doesn't get as much direct sunlight. Uh, but if you're a plant that wants sunlight, well, you'll be flatter and also very often a darker color of green. Um, remember when we talked about the albedo effect uh, and the lighter something is, the more it reflects sunlight, the darker it is, the more it absorbs. Uh, again, an example in the book of how an animal changes where it lives depending on the time of year because it just can't take those cold temperatures. <clears throat> a couple different rules when it comes to animals. Um, in general, in general, if you have the same animal and it's in a warmer climate, it will do things like well, these big ears, it doesn't need to hear extra in a dry climate or in a hot climate. But what this does is they actually circulate all their blood through their ears and it cools them off. That's why they have these big ears. Whereas the opposite is true, animals, further north they are, usually the smaller their ears are because they'll have a tendency to freeze off, right? Um, Um, also, usually the size of the body gets larger, um, and so that's one of the reasons why we have, you know, polar bears are so big. Uh, it's interesting, actually, I was just reading about uh, archaeologists that found uh, some of the older breeds of penguins that no longer exist, uh, but they were kind of giant penguins, and they were great big 300-pound penguins uh, that used to exist, uh, no longer do. Um, also... Well, <coughs> warm-blooded species, relative size of exposed portions of the body decreases with the decrease of the mean temperature, right? So smaller ear than a bear from a different area. Uh, smaller eyes, right? Less vulnerability to the cold. Um, these types of things. Also larger bodies so you could store up heat and preserve heat. Um, no, I'm not going to go through lists of a million different things. Um, I will say that uh, a number of different plants, um, they develop similar strategies, uh, well, as it says, adopting to reduce water stress, as it says. Uh, so long roots, so that during dry periods of time, it can reach more thick trunks, so it can store more water, waxy coating, small leaves. Nocturnal photosynthesis. Um, cactuses are kind of the classic example. Uh, I think people in general kind of know 
know what a cactus is? Um, predators, predators. Uh, there's many different types of predators. Um, it's usually, if a predator is gonna hunt something to extinction, it's usually non-native or, or as I would say, an invasive species. Um, also, species have a fair amount of mutualism. Uh, that is when you have species that rely upon each other. So for example, you could have uh, an insect uh, that is very tied to a specific type of plant. So if something happens to that plant, that plant doesn't exist somewhere, uh, that insect or animal also doesn't exist in that place. Right? Um, keystone species. Uh, that's one of those key terms, actually, keystone species. species uh, whose effects indirectly supports many other species within an ecosystem. Uh, and these are kind of difficult to find out often, how kind of uh, vital different species are in different areas. Uh, so for example, they use a good example of, um, in Yellowstone, when they reintroduce the wolves. Uh, well, this is kind of a big news story for a while. Um, but let's back up. Wolves were gotten rid of uh, for a number of different reasons. A lot of farmers just didn't want the wolves around their livestock. Um, so a number of wolves were killed off for a number of different reasons. They were thought of as dangerous predators and so on and so forth. Uh, and people wanted to have more elk uh, in general, especially uh, for hunting and things like that. Uh, well, through time, without uh, the wolf to take down the elk population, um, the elk were eating uh, the, the, the saplings and sprouts of a number of different tree species. Uh, and so the, the dynamic of what tree species existed changed in Yellowstone. They also happen to be a number of the trees that beavers specifically like to use to create their beaver dams. And beaver dams, uh, well, they're, they, they create uh, rich areas for, for uh, ecosystem diversity, right? Because put up a little dam, it'll create a little pond, uh, it'll bring more water into an area, um, plants and animals will be able to have different areas of, of set water uh, as the water sometimes attempts to go around the dams, it will spread out where it is. Uh, well, they, when scientists saw all these connections and kind of what was going on, they thought, well, what if we introduce the wolves um, and sure enough, through time, the wolves were able, able to kind of bring that ecosystem back to the way it was before. So biological limiting factors. As it says, competition. Um, competition, there's lots of different ways that, that you could have competition. Uh, mutualism, uh, I actually mentioned this a little bit before relationship between two species from which both species benefit. Um, I would say there's lots of examples of mutualism, uh, especially uh, aquatic. I would say different bird species that live off of insects and animals uh, is a surprisingly widespread uh, in different areas of the world. All right, dispersal. Um, well, most species are attempting to disperse. They're always attempting to broaden their territory, uh, but they're usually hitting limits. Uh, let's put it that way. <clears throat> um, so colonization, right, that term, in the physical geography, that's talking about the, the establishment of plants and animals into new territories. Like I said, all plants and animals would love to be everywhere around the globe, uh, but they often, well, they hit, hit limits of where they can, they can be, put it that way. Um, dispersal, right, how are things spread about? Obviously, animals just try to spread themselves about, right? Um, there's uh, plenty of other species that, uh, well, are more passive dispersers. A uh, number of examples, you probably know, like birds eat seeds and then poop it out and the plants go elsewhere. Tumbleweeds, 
Three, there's a reason they tumble. It's because every time they tumble, they shake a little bit of their seeds loose, and so that spreads them over an area. Uh, it was an adaptation for an area that was very windy, especially certain times of the year. <clears throat> Found geographic barriers and corridors um, and filters. I think I got a picture. Well, I got a few pictures that kind of show how this happened. Um, so in nature, uh, if animals are attempting to disperse, often if there's something that happens, um, you can't really tell here, but this is a little fire. A little fire is kind of a classic example of how an area uh, can be kind of cleared out, um, and that is a way for species that are around it to colonize that area. Uh, sometimes there are corridors that plants can take where they'll kind of get a quicker range of space uh, compared to if they were trying to go through the forest or something. Um, so in this example, we have, we have a number of different things happening. Um, so for example, well, we got a species of tree, um, but these are trees that, for example, cannot uh, survive if the water table is too high, right? So you'll have, in areas where you have kind of eco-tolerance changing, you'll have some pioneer species that are kind of like trying to venture out, uh, but they'll often just kind of look sickly and like they're just not doing well. That's a sign that they're kind of at their zone of tolerance. Um, when it comes to corridors for things like invasive species, humans make a lot of those corridors. You know, if you're driving around and you see some power lines, you probably have noticed that the whole area underneath it is usually kept mowed uh, because people want to access those power lines if there's ever a problem or anything. Uh, but what that does is that, that creates an uh, easy little path for, for different plants and animals to, to migrate through. Um, and then, like I said, the other classic example is if you have a fire somewhere, and then these can colonize that area. Uh, lots of different types of dispersals. Uh, I'm not going to go through every type of dispersal. Um, again, like I said, but this is kind of the reason why geographers like to study islands, uh, especially if they're new, because it's just like the slate has been wiped clean, and we could just examine what plants and animals would come first, right? Um, there's a little study in the book. I'm not going to go through every detail about it, but basically it looks at uh, the speed that plants and animals can kind of spread from island to island, right? often can de depend on currents, can depend on lots of different things. There are a couple different areas of the world that have historically had enough of a separation between places that the plants and animals within the different areas are relatively unique, put it that way. Um, and the book also talked about this controversy about the, the cattle egret, right? It's like, well, is it an invasive species or is it not an invasive species? Well, cattle did not live in the Americas. They were brought over. Um, as you can see, the first time people kind of noticed this bird, well, it was with cattle, and it was this part of the world in uh, 1933. Now, we don't have any direct evidence of anyone bringing these animals uh, there, but they showed up, right? So we have to deduce in our heads in the 1930s, it's very likely that it was just some people who brought them and then just didn't tell anybody, right? Because like, I don't know, it's 1933. Is there, you gotta check with anybody? Well, um, these were successful animals. They were especially successful because humans were, resha were reshaping this landscape to create, well, changed a lot of rainforests into pasture land, right? Cut down the rainforest, selling those trees, changing it into pasture land. Um, and so since it's pasture land and they're breeding uh, cattle, you can see the, the bird uh, just basically went with it, right? Uh, and stayed with it to the point that it's over a very large range of territory. Uh, it's one of those things that I, I would think it would fit the definition of an invasive species, but it doesn't especially fight with other species for survival. There's not other birds that are trying to, to take care of this cow this way, this bird will live off of grooming it uh, and eating the insects that attempt to embed themselves in it. 
ecological disturbance and succession. Talked about this a bit uh, already. Uh, another example um, of landscapes that are kind of wiped clean are big landslides. Those are often examined to try to see what plants and animals come through first. Uh, I'm not gonna, like I said, lots of lists. Um, fires, fires. Again, another way that, that places can be wiped clean and we could uh, analyze animal succession. Uh, but of course, fires don't always wipe the slate clean because uh, a lot of plants have adapted to fire because there's nothing unnatural about fire, right? Um, so a number of different mechanisms for adapting, similar to a strategy for places that don't have a lot of water, having some deep roots so you could kind of re-sprout uh, yourself if there's been a large fire, right? Or trees that can grow from their roots, especially if there's been a big fire. Uh, well, pine cones, and they point out that after fire, uh, well, is, is, is uh, when they release their seeds, I would say that, that that's slightly misleading because actually sustained amounts of direct sunlight are usually hot enough to do it. Uh, but this, this plant has been successful in the fact that after a fire happens and competition has been wiped away, it can then germinated seeds uh, but if enough time has gone by and it hasn't like I said if it warms up enough it will it will do it without a fire uh, it'll just be more successful if there is a fire <clears throat> uh, the book also brings up kind of the controversy about managing fire because uh, like I said there's nothing unnatural about fire um, but 